Um, so what I'm going to talk about is something all very new stuff. So this is, I do it very often, like very rare that I actually make my complete slide deck. So uh, the half of the slide deck is completely new. So what I mean to say is that I will, I'm looking for feedback on this slide deck. So if you guys, none of this is like even published yet in the sense that they have been accepted but not published. So if you have any feedback, I would love to hear. I'm here for two days, um, like today and tomorrow. So feel free to email me and schedule a meeting if you have some provocative thoughts or you do not agree, or if you agree even, that's fine. Okay, since all of you are at AI2, I'm sure all of you have heard the story for the last five years, what's happening in the field of AI. We are seeing significant advancement in visual representation, thanks to deep learning or convolutional neural networks. We are seeing uh, amazing results, which we even, which when I started as a PhD student, I didn't even think I'll see it in my lifetime. But if you think and compare what, with what we are doing, uh, with what humans do, both learning and inference in the current paradigm are still very narrow in scope. For example, let's look at the learning. The way all the learning works right now is you collect a large data set, like lots of images, you label those images, and then you do supervised one-shot learning. Supervised because humans are labeling individual objects, scenes, and so on, and one-shot because you learn a model, you, your favorite deep learning model, or SVM or something, and you forget about it. You do not bring that, bring that model back to use it for some other task or something. You just you train it one time, and you forget about it. Now compare this to how learning happens in humans. In humans, first of all, we do not look at hundreds of different types of mushrooms or dogs to learn our representation. Most of our representation learning is unsupervised in nature. Second, the learning in human is continuous and lifelong. That is, we are even continuing to learn even at this age. Um, and we can keep learning every day and every moment. And finally, we are not learning one different model for audio, a, third, a second model for haptic, a third model for vision. We actually combine all the learning into one common model of the, how the world works. So we are learning from diverse sources and for diverse different tasks. But even forget all these reasons. There is one reason why the current paradigm is just not going to work, because Manual labeling is just not scalable. For example, in computer vision, the, one of the biggest object detection data set is ImageNet, which has labeled one million bounding boxes over five years. If you are talking about common sense knowledge, CYC has one of the longest effort that has been continuing. It has collected two million or even more, I, I think this is an older number, they've collected two million common sense facts and they're continuing to do so over 30 years. Now compare this, to what we actually need to achieve. For example, on Facebook, again, these are older numbers, but more than 400 million images are uploaded daily. And when it comes to common sense, we still don't know how many such facts exist. Some people estimate there are billions of such facts that we need to learn. So on the learning side, we can clearly see that current paradigm is just not the way to go. But on the other hand, on the inference side, we all know that humans have this amazing ability to detect or recognize objects, even with zero examples. For example, if someone told you, tell you that it is a category called elephant shoe, it looks like a mouse, it has trunk, it has tail, and so on, and you can basically, you see this animal in the next Im image, you can easily say that this is an elephant shoe, even though you have never seen this example in the past. But our current deep learning approaches cannot actually do that. Uh, we need to see at least 100 examples, if not more, to actually do any kind of detection for any category. So my research focuses on tackling both these challenges. First, I want to scale up learning by building these self-supervised lifelong learning system. I want to go from a million images to billion images in my long-term goal. But more importantly, I also want to use whatever we have learned, this visual knowledge about the world, how the world works, for visual tasks and reasoning. So towards these goals, we have been doing a lot of efforts. For example, one of the research goals that we have been trying to do is how can we train unsupervised uh, convolutional neural networks in a completely unsupervised way without using any ImageNet type labels. So we have approaches where we can learn from static images or videos by using some auxiliary task, and we can come very close to ImageNet performance. So if you take ImageNet, a network trained with ImageNet, it gives you 68.6 on object detection, and we can go with self-supervised learning up to 63.2. But here we are only trying to learn the basic representation. To do the task, we still need to fine tune it with some task data. But to even tackle that challenge uh, and to bring in lifelong learning system, 
In 2013, we built a system NEIL. NEIL stands for Never Ending Image Learner. So it's a computer program that runs, that ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And all it was trying to do was something very simple. It goes to images, internet every day. It downloads images and the text associated with it. Using this data, it aligns the text, like the nouns and the images, and it basically learns categories, like visual models for different categories. So here is a model for Camry. It then uses whatever object detection models it has learned to label the unsupervised, to, to unlabeled data in like millions of images. So for example, in these images, there are cars, road, and parking lot. And then it uses all this data that all the detections and the uh, classification it has done to build a common sense visual knowledge base. For example, it, it can uh, learn things like cars run on roads, cars are found in parking lot, and so on. So Neil was basically a lifelong learning system. The key idea being learning one thing improves the ability to learn the next. So you go for first simple things, you try to learn simple facts, and then you go for harder and harder. So for example, if Neil downloaded an image like this, it will say, okay, this is too hard for me to say what object this is. So it will go step by step. So first it will try to learn a simple model of cars. It will also try to learn models of wheel and what is metallic. It will learn common sense facts, like cars have wheels, cars are metallic, cars are found on road, and then it will use all this knowledge to understand that this object is nothing but a car, because I see wheels, I see the metallic, I see it on the road, and that's how it basically increases its definition of categories every day. So in the first version of Neil, we let it run for two years, uh, in these two years, it learned models like 60,000 object detection models. For example, it, has, it can learn different meaning of bean. Sorry, it's the image actually turns out, turned out to be really bad. But the, it's Mr. Bean, Sean Bean, and Bean the Food. For Falcon, it learned different models like car, bike, and bird. It learned common sense, 20,000 common sense facts. For example, wheel is a part of a car, eye is a part of a baby, helicopters are found in airfield, and so on. But after two years, we actually decided that we need to now de, uh, stop this uh, process and restart this process because there are a lot of challenges that we initially didn't think of. So over the two years, while we learned a lot of things as in terms of common sense facts, we also learned what are the real challenges in making up a visual knowledge base. So in this talk, I want to talk about what kind of challenges we faced when we were building Neil and how are we nowadays tackling them or trying to tackle them. And specifically, what I'm going to talk about, how we can actually scale up learning more than what we actually initially imagined, and how can we reason with knowledge, essentially. So the first challenge that we faced was the scaling up of categories. So when in the original version of Neil, we ended up learning 60,000 models. But if you think we need to scale up these to more than 100 times, like there are more than a few million categories that we actually need to learn. Thus, also another related challenge was the, we wanted to learn some higher order relationships. For example, small mesh chairs are uncomfortable for people to sit. Something like that requires you to learn a model of a small mesh chair. And so basically what we need to tackle both these challenges is to learn visual models of some rare categories or compositional categories. Things like small mesh chair is compositional. You have to use a model of chair, you have to use a model of mesh, and you have to use attribute small, and somehow combine all the three together to basically learn what is a small mesh chair. Now, in Neil, the way we try to tackle the challenge, and in fact, there's a system here as well, Levan, um, which has similar ideas. We basically went to web, and we said we'll use the web data to try to learn these visual models. Now, learning the visual models for a car makes sense, because there are lots of cars on the web, and if you look at the top ranking image search results for car, it's fine. But as you start going to these rare and compositional categories, the web results start to deteriorate very quickly. So just learning from the web, just saying that we will actually use the small mesh, uh, mesh uh, chair on an image net, like image search, download images and learn a model is really not going to work. Someone can argue here that maybe we can compose these classifiers. We can learn small, we can learn mesh, we can learn uh, chairs, and then compose it using graphical models or simple, maybe have probability for each of them, multiply them. But in vision, composition is not so easy. For a composition comes with this big problem of contextuality. So for example, if you try, okay. If you try to combine red with the tomato or red with wine, the meaning of red changes based on what category you are trying to combine with. 
So composition by just saying that I can learn one model of red, one model of tomato, and I can combine it with any two random categories is not going to work. We need to respect contextuality while doing these compositions. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we can respect composition, uh, how we can do composition by respecting contextuality. How we can basically see what categories we are combining with to take different meanings of the different words. Now, even if I do this, and even if I scale up the learning to this tail categories, by the way, feel free to ask questions if you have. What Neil was trying to do was, it was trying to learn a visual knowledge graph like this. Like it has categories, it has different kind of relationships, for example, part relationships, it can even have functional and physical relationships and so on. And when we started this goal, this project, my goal was to basically use this knowledge graph for reasoning on vision task. And I thought that this is the way to go, right? I mean, it seems that we need to use this kind of reasoning about the world to solve vision task. But in the last five years, how many papers do you see using knowledge graph for reasoning or something? Because at the end of the day, when you compare to end-to-end -to -end learning from deep network, they just beat the uh, performance, whatever you end up doing. If you have some amount of data, you basically can do end-to-end -end learning, and it will basically uh, do work much better than any knowledge graph reasoning or something like that. So in the next part of the talk, we, uh, is yes. Is that also true at the tail? Um, so at the tail, basically neither works. That's what I would say. <laughs> uh, at the head, basically deep network seems to work. At the tail, I think right now, I would say nothing works. And that's what we want to, it's actually zero shot is one place where you can say um, like these knowledge graph would work, but that's where we actually get beaten by these word two like semantic embedding stuff. So you can do semantic embedding of these categories and then use them to directly uh, interpolate the, or extrapolate the classifiers and they actually work better than knowledge graph. So, I mean, I started like in my own research, I started this big project, Neil. I kept on saying that this is the way to go. But whenever I would go with and present it to someone, everyone would ask me, what do I use it for? And at the end of the day, it seems that the standard end-to-end -end learning or deep learning works. So in the last one year, we have been really focusing on how to really combine knowledge graphs with end-to-end -end learning itself to basically tackle this challenge. So you, I mean, these two are really not like uh, against each other. They can, they're actually complementary. You can even include knowledge graphs into end-to-end -end learning. And so in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about a couple of efforts on how we are trying to integrate knowledge graphs and end-to-end -end learning. Now, even in both these cases, we are trying to learn from internet data or YouTube videos, which are passive data. But if you think the way humans learn, humans basically learn by really physically interacting with the world. So for example, we push objects, we poke with toys when we are babies, we even put objects in our mouth. And in all these cases, while we are doing these activities, we are learning a visual representation of the world. We are learning physical common sense. For example, what happens when you push objects? Heavy objects will move slowly, uh, lighter objects will move fast, and so on. So one of the challenges I wanted to uh, focus on was how we can extend from these semantic knowledge base that we are building with Neil to more a complete version of a knowledge base, which has physics, functionalities, and so on. So in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how we are building a physical version of a NEEL where we are basically exploring hundreds and thousands of objects with robots and trying to learn a knowledge base about the physics, functionalities, and so on. And of course, I am being really ambitious. I think I will do three, but we'll see how the time goes. Okay, so let me start with the first part where I want to focus on this composition and contextuality problem. Okay, but I, I think I have motivated enough by saying that um, I want to scale up my learning to hunt, uh, like tens of thousands of categories, and this requires learning for rare and compositional categories. And initially, when I, we started Neil, we thought web has answer to everything. You just go to image search, download images, and it will work. So as a, as a case study, I basically came up with this uh, possum. So if you go to image search and you search for possum, you basically see this is the second page of the search. It looks pretty good. I mean, most of them are possums, and they look, uh, the figures look really nice. Um, so it seems that I can learn a model of, visual model of possum from these images. But what about if I look for wet possum? And if you look at the second page of the search results, there's hardly, so there's one wet possum here, and that's it probably. There's like one or two examples, in this, and that's only second page. So I'm talking about like 20th or 30th uh, result. So you can see already 
that wet possum is just one level of composition. Like I am only combining two different classifiers. It's already starting to fail the image search. So it seems that if I'm trying to learn a model of wet possums out of these images, it's going to be a bad model to begin with. Yes. What do you mean when you say image search? You mean Google? Google image search. Yeah, I mean, it basically says that as you start increasing your, uh, basically combining multiple categories, like multiple cat or make compositional categories, there's much, much less data on the web. And even if there is data, it's so hard to, uh, the data is so unorganized that it's so hard to retrieve it in some uh, automatic manner. It's for everyone, actually. I mean, Google is the best, by the way, right now, in that sense. In, in image search, there's nothing better than Google. So there is no reason, uh, I mean, I can talk about some other work where, Basically, we have tried to search for it from directly from tags, but there's just no way you can retrieve enough wet possums in an automatic manner. <laughs> it's just hard. I mean, there is hardly, um, okay, just to make sure that you agree with it. How many wet possums have you seen in your life? <laughs> I mean, probably none, none, right? But if I ask you, I mean, and I can run this challenge, I mean, so in your real life, you have not seen one, but if I ask you, can you think of what a wet possum looks like? Probably you can have a very good model of wet possum. And this is what your, hopefully your wet possum in your mind looks like. So it seems that we humans can do it. I mean, we can somehow combine these categories without even seeing enough data. So how did we do it? Now, hopefully, what we ended up doing was we thought that possum is furry like dogs. So now I have enough seen enough wet dogs because they seem to be much more common in our life. So, and wet dogs have wet fur. So I can basically somehow transfer how it changes from dry to wet and I can make the same transfer here to understand what a wet possum would look like. So it seems what humans can do is they can combine the meaning of wet, they can combine the meaning of possum to basically create what, wet possums. But can we do it all the time? Or is there some trick here? So the, the trick is that the meaning of wet will change as you're basically trying to uh, combine it with different categories. So this, there, there's this, obviously, um, in, if you think in AI, the, one of the biggest challenges is creating this compositionality. Like how do you create, combine two classifiers? But compositionality is always at, uh, basically, at odds with contextuality. Because if you are saying that you can combine two primitive classifiers, but now you are saying that they actually depend on what classifiers you are combining. It's basically like the two things are talking about against each other. Can you actually combine it or not? That's the question we are trying to answer. So the problem what I'm stating is that when you are trying to basically learn uh, try, learn wet possums, there could be multiple meanings of wet. It could be, so here is a wet concrete, here is a wet tiles, a wet uh, glass, and in, on wet glass you can see the droplets emerge, but you will not see such droplets in wet possums, for example. And then there is this wet fur. So in the problem that we are trying to tackle is, how do we decide which meaning of wet to transfer? And that comes from the context. It, you have to decide which category you are combining your word wet with, and based on that, you have to decide what meaning of wet you will transfer. Just to show you another example, to convince you that this is really a problem, again, cracked could have multiple meanings. Cracked eggs look very different from cracked mirrors, look different from cracked tooth, and cracked lips, again, look very, very different. And when I'm asking a question like cracked glasses, you have to transfer the mirror meaning of crack to basically the cracked glasses. This is what we want to solve, that the, crack, the word cracked can have multiple meanings, and based on what category you are combining it with, you have to transfer something different. Now, before I go into the approach, let me just show you some results of what we can do if, we, if actually this works. So here we are tra transferring the word small. Again, the meaning of small for a snake and the elephant is completely different. A small elephant is still bigger than a human. Whereas a small snake is very, very small. It will feed, come into your hand. And you can see, so these are the, the small snake classifier has been learned using our approach. And these are the top kind of detections that you will see for small elephants. And, a uh, small cake. A more convincing uh, example, I mean, this I think is really convincing in the sense that old, the word old changes really meaning based on what category you are trying to combine. For example, old laptops are much more bulky, and that's what it tried, started retrieving when you actually learned a uh, category called old laptop versus old bike, which, which is completely different. Okay, so the problem that we are trying to solve here is that we have been given some input concepts, like wet and possum, and we somehow want to compose them to create a co compositional category classifier. So what I'm trying to learn is some kind of a compositional transform, some transformation that will basically somehow automatically uh, follow the three things which I, the three properties that I need for this transformation. 
The first property is that it should compose existing classifiers. So these primitives like red and tomato, they are existing, that you have some notion of red, you have some notion of tomato, but when you're combining them, the red tomato means something completely uh, different. It has to respect con context, that's the second requirement. That is the meaning of red should change based on what, class it, what category it's combining with. Somehow it has to be able to do that. And finally, the most important thing that we want this transformation to do is generalize to unseen combinations. So that is, you, at the training time, you have seen red, how red combines with tomato, how red combines with wine, and then at the test time, you want to see how red actually combines with some third category that you have never, never seen it combine in the past. For example, red dog. So our approach looks something very simple. We tried something very, very simple. So in this case, what we are going to do is, we are going to have uh, the individual classifiers like red and wine being represented by classifier weights. These are simple SVM weights. Um, these SVMs are running on the deep network features, VGG, M, on 1024 dimensions. So they are basically 1024 dimensional weight vectors. So we basically take these two weight vectors, like one weight vector for red, another weight vector for wine. We have a compositional transform, which we are, we are representing by a two layer linear, uh, neural network. And basically what we are hoping is we give these two weights as input and we'll get a red wine classifier as output, uh, the weight vector for red wine classifier somehow. Um, and just to make sure uh, that this satisfies, so you can see that it, it basically composes existing concepts like red and wine, it, it has a classifier for red, it has a classifier for wine, it is learning how to compose these two uh, classifiers. It respects context because both the things goes as input and so it can, if the uh, transformation is working, it can decide how to change uh, the outputs. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you wait for one minute, one more minute, I will come to the training. Uh, yeah. Uh, what if you don't have classifier weights for Yeah, so that's a that's the next thing I was going to say. Uh, and the best thing about this is that it can generalize to unseen combinations. So in the some sense, what you can do is um, you can basically take red and wine. You can try to replace wine with, uh, let's say, tomatoes if you have not seen red tomatoes in the training data. But more importantly. Let us suppose your knowledge base adds a completely new category called car. It, it was never there in the car when you were training this transformation. All you need to do is just change the SVM classifier here and it will basically try to uh, learn for that, uh, like combine for that. So the way it, this is working is basically it's trying to say, okay, what is this classifier closest to in the combination it has seen? So wine is closest to, let's say, water. And so then it says, well, how do I see the transformation red apply to water? So that's what it's doing. We are assuming that the, just one thing, the space of visual classifier is smooth, and that's why it's basically finding what is the closest visual classifier it, I can find to transfer from. Yes. Uh, how dare you use SVMs when we all know that the one true way is a deep learning? Or um, well, more specifically, are you using particular properties of SVMs? Yeah, so this is, uh, basically if you use softmax, then you actually have to relearn the whole last layer if you add another category. What we want is this feature that I actually trained on 1,000 classes, but tomorrow I add 10 more classes. I do not have to retrain my last classifier all completely. With SVMs, you can do that. You can just take this way. That's the reason why we went with SVMs in this class. Um, I am sure you can do it. I mean, in fact, you can do it with deep learning. There's not really. Last layer is anyhow uh, logistic regression. Yes. So you can even compose things like dog and wine? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, so if you try to compose things like uh, th those, will it work or not? Um, so I, generally, basically, it retrieves, it retrieves some garbage stuff. I mean, the way we are evaluating is we basically combine the classifier, and then we basically throw it 100,000 images, and it has to rank those images for that classifier, like mean average precision. Um, so it generally ret starts retrieving garbage if, it, if the combination is not really useful. Or it can think that dogs drink wine is the combination you are trying to generate, essentially. So, this, as I'll show in the results, that we can actually not do it with attributes and things, but you can even do it with SVOs. So you can feed subject, verb, object, three classifiers into it, and it'll basically give you an SVO classifier, like man on a bike, or man on top, man walking with bike, and so on. You can actually do those things as well with this, and it gives state-of-the-art performance for composing SVOs as well. Are you using any linguistic cues here? Like, do you know what this classifier is about? Right, so that is something which is definitely usable. And if you hold on to this thought a little, I mean, so I will basically do it in this part of the talk, I will not use it. I'll do use that as a baseline, that if you just use linguistic and didn't use that, uh, it works better. But in the second part of the talk, I'll come and combine linguistics with, like a knowledge base learn from nil with this thing and basically try to retackle the problem with uh, linguistic knowledge. Yes. 
Uh, yes, right now we are ignoring the order of the properties, but it will, it is implicitly represented in the order because as long as you're always feeding attributes at the top and uh, now now at the bottom, it automatically learns the order. Yeah, I mean, so right now it doesn't, yeah. I mean, the way we are, so in the first data set, we have attribute and noun combinations. So in this case, attribute always goes on the top. So order is somehow maintained. In the next data set, we have SVOs. So subject, verb, object. So again, the ordering is observed. But you can change O and S because you can, and that still works reasonably okay. Okay, um, so some of the details of how it is trained. Um, so we are going to assume that we have uh, data for some categories, some combinations. For example, red wine is common enough. So that's what I was saying. So some combinations exist. It's easy to find data. So you basically have red wines, and then you have a red classifier and wine classifier. You're going to let this red wine run through this deep neural network to get the FC7 features, and which is where we are going to do the dot. So this is basically the dot product with the final classifier output. And then you try to minimize the cross entropy loss directly uh, from this. So you know this is red, uh, red wine and your dot product should basically give high score to this for red wine, essentially. So this is how you basically train. Um, you assume that few categories are there at the training time. Um, the, uh, I'm basically going through quickly, but uh, the class, the neural network basically, if you have d-dimensionality as input, the first layer has 3D by two uh, neurons. The second dimension has 2D neurons. We use lakey relus because the negative weights of SVM can then help you basically uh, transfer the gradients because SVMs have negative weights as well. At the training time, we are going to assume that we have some combinations. So the blues are the combinations we have at the training time. And we are going to test on the combinations which are red, which we have never seen before in the past. Um, and so we have even, uh, so in this, uh, I'm not showing, but in the, uh, so if you actually have a category, so for example, this category, yes. So this category, for example, had no combinations in the training, but we can still test it in combination with something. Uh, and it still seems to work reasonably well. Um, so just going to qu quickly go through some experiments. Um, so we tested it on MIT uh, object data set. So the good thing is that in this data set, it has uh, each object with multiple attributes and each attribute with multiple objects. So for example, tomatoes ripe and unripe, tomatoes fresh and moldy. So you can see that multiple attributes are used with uh, same category essentially. Um, just in terms of statistics, there are 245 objects, 115 attributes. Um, we basically train on 1292 combinations, and we test on 700 unseen combinations uh, for, the for the testing. And for the training, we basically did 200,000 iterations. All these details do not matter, uh, in the sense that we did some grid search to find which is the best combination. Everyone does that nowadays. So, I, um, so in the, basically, at the end of the day, to compare the baselines, um, there are three different baselines we basically uh, used. The first is you can actually use individual object classifier and attribute classifier and compare with them. So if I just use red or just use tomato as a classifier and get the mean average position, how would it look like? The second thing you can try to do is something like a late fusion and this is like you get a probability of attribute, you get probability of object, you multiply those two probabilities and get the output. And this is the one which uh, Ani, you are asking like, so. You can also think of not using, not using the visual classifiers, but thinking of word to vec going as input. Word to vec for red, word to vec for wine, and you try to combine and create a red wine out of it. And so in this case, we are using linguistic similarity instead of visual similarity. So this is our baseline in this uh, in this paper, essentially. How do you apply that to classifier? Um, no, no. So the in inputs are uh, word to vec, yeah. but the output is still a visual classifier. The the layers basically learn how to map semantic like word to semantic embedding to a visual classifier, so that's what the neural network is doing in that scenario. Uh, and in fact, that is exactly what I'm going to show you in the second part. It seems to work reasonably well if you have enough layers into the system. Uh, um, no, so we are just predicting the final uh, classifier for red tomato or red wine essentially. Um, and we basically, like a, binary like a binary classifier, exactly. Okay. Yes and no classifier. And um, so I'm not going to show because I want to go through a lot of stuff, but we have lots of ablative experiment to show that the red tomato and the tomato classifier is diff drastically different. And it is very different from any other class classifier in the data set. So we are just not memorizing and stuff. Like if you do nearest neighbor, this would not work if you do. So we have done all those kind of ablation studies, but I'm not going to show it here, uh, at least in these experiments, the talk, yes. So 
No, I completely agree, and that's why I'm go I'm going to have this next part where I'm going to do that. Uh, I mean, I'm not even arguing against like not using word embedding or word or some kind of linguistic knowledge. Uh, it's definitely useful. Uh, you can use that, but at least in this project, we just wanted to see how far you can go without doing word embedding. Uh, word embedding. Uh, in the next part, I'm going to come to the word embedding essentially. Um, okay, so. Again, the numbers individually do not matter, but the mean average precision for our approach is 10.4. If you do visual product, it's 8.8. .8. Word embeddings is not as good. If you just take word embeddings and map it directly uh, to the uh, classifier, it just basically gives you 7.9. Um, and we also tried it with subject verb object. So in this case, there are 100 subjects and objects, 70 predicates. We have 4,000 test images. So basically, we are training on 6,600 tuples, and we are testing on around 1,000 tuples. To just show you what the problem looks like, this is the data set. So for example, between man and uh, bicycle, there will be different possible predicates that can, it could be man riding bicycle, man falling off, man pushing, man next to, or man carrying bicycle. And so basically, this is not a easy, like you're just having two, knowing man and bicycle would not basically work. You need to basically adapt your learning to what predicate it is. Um, of course, now we are combining three, so the performances are a uh, little lower, but it basically works. Uh, much better than any of the baselines uh, that we have been trying to see. Okay, and as I said, we did a lot of uh, ablative analysis, but uh, since I want to talk about some other stuff, I'm going to jump in uh, of that. So yes? One more question. The, your last example very quickly made me think that uh, something implicit here is the relationship, right? So when you're talking about the composition and context, right, it's, it's binary, but really the relationship between red and wine or you know, all, all these things. The bicycle example is great. Right. It's really a triple, not a double. Right, I mean, sure. I mean, if you, it can even be higher order. I mean, frankly, I'm not, I mean, so we have gone up to triplets, but you, you can even have small mesh. I mean, I think you can I keep adding. Um, so you're right. I mean, so generally, I think what happens in these cases, even in the case of attributes, when you're saying there's a relationship, it automatically assigns a third, whatever is the third possible thing uh, it wants to assign, essentially. Right, but isn't that uh, uh, an issue? In other words, when there are, if, uh, right, if the relationship is always the same, then that's going to work. But if the relationship is different, then that's So I think in case of attribute, it's all, I'm going to make a claim that it's almost the same. If we had like part attributes, so these are only very specific kind of attributes, which are like uh, color, size, and so on. If you had things like objects, have, oh, sorry, bike has wheels. So wheels and bike are you trying to combine, things like those, then I think it will not work. I mean, you need extra relationships. But in this case, I think it's the data set is restricted enough that it can just apply that meaning immediately for there. Okay, so um, even if this thing basically works and we end up basically learning these big knowledge graphs, one of the problems that I actually talked about, we want to focus on was that how can we use these knowledge graphs for vision tasks? For example, image classification, object detection, and so on. The biggest problem we always faced is that whenever we try to use these knowledge graphs, at the end of the day, if you actually have a neural network learning being learned end to end, it just outperforms uh, the, uh, the uh, basically the original knowledge graph based approach. And we tried lots of approaches for the first one and one year and so on. So instead of trying to fight end-to-end -end learning, basically what we decided was that maybe end-to-end -end learning does provide something useful. And so can we actually combine these knowledge graphs and end-to-end -end learning, essentially? So the goal is basically we are trying to bring these knowledge graphs into end-to-end -end learning framework. And what, we are, uh, and what we want are the three requirements from our framework. The first, it has to be efficient because knowledge graphs are going to be huge. So it can, like for example, Nell has more than 200 million uh, edges in its, um, in its knowledge graph. So it has to be efficient, it cannot be uh, slow. Second, it has to be able to handle noise because we are building these knowledge graphs automatically. We do not have humans labeling these graphs. So there's always going to be a lot of noise. Like uh, for example, Neil has 20% noise uh, in the initial iteration and it basically in keeps increasing as we uh, go on. So you can see that the noise is a big factor. So you should be somehow um, basically robust to these noises in the knowledge graph. And the most important thing of why you want to do it, you want to have some explainability in your results. Like if you said that this is a chair, can you actually go back in your knowledge graph, see what happened in your knowledge graph and predict why are you saying this is a chair? So that was our main goal of why we actually want to bring knowledge graph and end-to-end -end learning into this common framework. 
So the core idea behind this approach is we are going to use end-to-end -end learning to learn an information propagation model on top of the graph. So what we are going to assume is the graph structure is learned by these knowledge-based learning approaches like Neil, NEL, or it could be anything. Um, and what we still want to learn is how does the information passes from man to bicycle when the relationship is on top of? What information passes? And that is going to be learned with respect to a task uh, in an end-to-end -end manner. So what does it mean? Um, so essentially, what we are going to do is we are going to learn this information propagation. So each node in the graph is going to be represented by a hidden state. So if there is uh, things like person, horse, jeans, and uh, skateboard, each will have its own hidden state, which is a 10-dimensional vector in our case. What we then want to learn is how does the, and so if, given, if my given current hidden state is H11, how does it affect H2 at the next iteration? So that's what we want to learn. We want to learn the transformation of how information passes from H1 to H2, H2 to H3, and so on. The key here is that we are going to learn different parameters for different types of uh, relationship. So basically, these are just linear transformations going from here to here. Uh, you just apply a linear transformation. But the parameters of that linear transformation are going to be fixed given the edge type. So there's going to be one set of linear parameters, uh, weight vectors for, uh, let's say, on top of, another set of weight uh, vectors for next to, and so on. So if you have two different types of edges, they have different uh, weight vectors that are being applied here. And then you also basically combine it with your, so the way the information travels is, bike says something about man here. So this, suppose this is bike, this is, let's say, road, and this is man. So bike and road say something, how to update man, but also you use your previous iteration, like previous hidden state to decide how you should change. So you basically combine this information, uh, all the three into this one uh, update rule. And you are going to learn these weight vectors by doing this end-to-end uh, -end learning. This is simple, like learning a belief propagation on top of this graph, and the, weight uh, the weights of these belief propagation are going to be learned in an end-to-end -end manner. So basically what you do is you have these different update rules, you keep updating for T iterations. After T iterations, you take all the hidden states and you basically learn another layer on top and you basically try to classify is object one present in the image or not, object two. So we are looking at classification, multi-label classification. So you can have multiple labels in the same image and you basically try to do this multi-label classification whether it's present or not. Um, and based on, so you will have a loss function here for multi-label classification and the uh, back, back prop, the gradients basically propagate through the whole network and basically help you to learn the weight vectors for information propagation. Is each superscript then each time slice, is that a level of compositionality? So red wide would be just two time steps, is that what you're showing? Um, so I mean, we basically do up to tight three time steps, but it's saying that how far the information is traveling. So this is one hop travel, this is two hop travel, three hop travel, and so on. So at this point, you're not doing any compositionality, you're just saying what, what classifiers can provide contextual cues to what other classifiers. Right, yeah, exactly. So we are just doing contextual reasoning here, and no compositionality or nothing here. Uh, so compositionality was being used to just learn these graphs, essentially. How do you decide about these? Just by hand. I mean, I think we use five or six, uh, based on how many you can do so that, I mean, I'm going to tell you that what's a big problem with T. There's a problem with T, if you just wait for a second. Um, now, of course, I have still not told you how to basically initialize these hidden states. So for initialization, we are going to use basically the detection pipeline. So what we are going to do is given an image, we first use faster RCN, whatever is your state of the art detector to basically know that there is a person with this probability, there is a car with 0.9 probability, there is a bike with 0.5 probability, and so on. And these are used to basically start the, or assign the initial uh, hidden state to these uh, nodes in the graph. So you can think of it as you have a big knowledge graph, nodes get activated by initial deep network detectors, and then the information travels in this knowledge graph to basically do the reasoning and say, uh, and I'm gonna show you some kind of reasoning that happens in these graphs in the explainability section, essentially. Now, of course, uh, as Ruzbe said that, how do you decide T? The problem is T is like a restriction factor. The back propagation is basically uh, o order of n raised to power T. As the number of nodes increase, the, you have to pass the information to every node if you actually use the whole graph. Um, so what we do is first, we don't keep T very high. We only keep it, I think, four or five. I don't remember exactly what we used in the final experiment. Um, and another thing is that, um, so back propagation becomes imp uh, intractable if the T is large, if the N is large, and so on. Um, and the second thing what we do is, we basically use 
uh, importance, uh, basically we, the, instead of using the whole graph at a time, we basically grow the graph as we are doing this reasoning. We decide what kind of nodes are likely to be active inside this image, and slowly and slowly we act, uh, increase the radius of reasoning, essentially. So how does it uh, work in the end? So the first thing is given an image, you first do object detections, that initializes the nodes, so the, the nodes that have been detected gets initialized uh, by the graph. Then basically we do the one hop to this vector and we basically pass the information to all the nodes that are in one hop to any of these detected nodes. They update their state vector. Using the updated state vectors, we basically then figure out uh, the importance of each node. Like what are the remaining nodes that are there in the graph? We find out, okay, what is the importance of each node? And based on the importances, we decide that this node needs to be expanded and this needs to be expanded. Again, this is learning and uh, the importance thing is again done in end-to-end manner, it's an, just another uh, linear transformation. So you decide, okay, these nodes need to be expanded, so you basically add the nodes here and you keep doing that for uh, t time steps essentially. Um, so the finally, what our pipeline looks like is given an image, you basically take the VGG net to get the FC7 features, you also get the detections from the uh, faster RCNN then detections and the knowledge graph goes as input to our approach, and we basically combine the hidden state of all the nodes in our graph, FC7 images, and the detections to basically the last layer, and we basically give the final class output whether the class is there or not. The reason we combine detections here is because our approach is uses detection. So we want to have, make sure that the baseline also gets the detection as well. So it's not that the detectors are making our classifiers work, it's the, yes. Right. Do you have some intuition of what's, your, what's the target hidden state that you're trying to learn? So we are not restricting the hidden state at all. Um, so while I'm going to argue that we have more explainability than current and networks, but in this case, our hidden states are completely not in our hand. I mean, they can just take whatever information they want to take. However, I can track how the information is traveling inside the, to basically get some explainability out of these approaches. Uh, but it's, so I would say it's interpretable, but not, the level of interpretability is not there as what you are thinking right now. So right now they are just random. We just don't know what they mean. Um, okay, for the experiments, what we did was we uh, tested it on uh, the visual genome and COCO data set. For learning the knowledge graph, we basically used two way sources. We used the visual genome, which has human labeled knowledge graph, and we basically, uh, for each image instance, and we combine it Together, so each image has a scene graph. We combine all the scene graphs into one big knowledge graph and make sure that enough repetitions are there to add an edge to the thing. We also combine it with WordNet just to see if we actually have a bigger knowledge graph, how would it help? So here are some of the performances and these are classification performances. Uh, right now there's no detection happening. So uh, the, if you just take VGG, this is end to end, it gives you 60 like So you first end on ImageNet and fine tune it on the data set, COCO data set or genome data set. You get around 70 mean average precision. Um, on genome, you get 31 mean average precision. You, because our approach uses detection in the pipeline, you should provide the detections as a baseline to the baselines as well. That helps you to boost performances by 4% here and around 1% here. Um, if you combine it with knowledge graph, you see there's a significant boost, like uh, around 3.5% if you start using knowledge graphs here. Uh, it's much less in the genome. But we found out that that's probably because the data is much more noisy than we actually, so COCO is very nicely labeled data set, uh, has stood the test of time in terms of benchmarks. Uh, genome, we found that the labeling is really, really noisy to begin with. Um, finally, th this is the interesting thing, WordNet seems to hurt uh, in the case of COCO, and it seems to help in the case of uh, uh, the uh, visual genome, but be, be almost like negligible. I would say it's in the range of noise, essentially, the amount of increase. So um, that is something which we have been trying to explain, but we just don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, is it right to interpret your model as uh, learning to select the subset of the knowledge graph and learning to encode that into Right, the right. So if that is true, then um, uh, what about like, trying something simpler to select that subset? So for example, you have the detection scores, and you can select those nodes in the graph, and like one of edges around it. Um, but you still have to learn the information propagation model, right? Um, but you can like encode it using word vectors or something. Like that. So you're saying that somehow the word information travels or something? Uh, yeah, or you do some kind of averaging or something? Yeah, maybe average or just. Um, yeah, so 
we didn't do that baseline in this paper, but the next paper does that baseline, and that does not work at all. That's actually really bad. If you do, if you do not learn a propagation model and you just use it, you'd use this model. In a, so I think what this approach does, it basically decides for the task of classification, what kind of edges are important, how should that information travel on it. And that is why, the, so we have tried like adding noise to this thing. You keep adding noise to the graph, and it's very robust to noise. That's probably because the information propagation model on the top learns to ignore what are the noisy edges because it, it's doing this task-based end-to-end learning with the graph. Uh, so for the propagation model, the, the, um, why do you not pass it? Like at and why only questions? Because like if there's a man on the bike, uh, I mean, the probability of man riding the bike versus man not riding the bike, it cannot be reduced on just So um, that's a good question. I just don't know how to transfer the full FC7 node-wise. Um, so I want to transfer it, actually. That's something which we have discussed. Like the full FC7 provides some kind of context or something into the whole system. We just don't know how to do it. Because the information about man, bikes, and something are hidden in it. We have to do act, like node-based activation. Maybe you are saying that we should add 1,000 dimensions to every input, essentially, uh, at hidden, every hidden state. We can do that, but then it becomes computationally just huge. Like right now, the hidden states are 10 dimension only. What you are saying is make the hidden states 1,000 dimensions. That kind of kills the computation, essentially. Okay, it makes Which part? The right. Uh, yeah, so that, I mean, so because we are using the, I mean, you can just add this thing to the, because it's only one layer after it. It depends how many layers. It, information propagation takes multiple, like, because of, in the information propagation, you do first level of transfer, then second level of transfer, and then third level of transfer. That's why you, the dimensionality increases would mean that the weight vector increases are huge. OK, um, so the reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to go on to this was we can generate some kind of interpretability. We can look at the graph and figure out why it's being classified or what is being classified why. So for example, in this image, the network gives um, the output as genes. And we were interested in knowing how did it do genes. Um, it should be pointed out that the activation does not have genes, like the initial uh, initialization, because genes is not a detector which is there in uh, Coco. So this is what the graph looks like around the genes and the human area, uh, just to see. Uh, so basically, person wears jeans, um, then person is on top of horse, there's horse, there's skateboard, and so on. And we looked at basically how the information travels, the sensitivity values, and we found out that the way it's deciding that this is genes, there are two main classifiers, the person um, is very, very important, and the skateboard. So what basically network has learned is this order, uh, third order relationship that people who are doing skateboards are much likely to wear jeans than and other people. And that's how it basically decides uh, that uh, this basically this is bas uh, a jeans classifier should fire here, uh, essentially. Interesting one is the next one. It's horse. And so the reason it is horse is because people who, wear, who are on horses also tend to seem to have wear a lot of jeans in the data set. Uh, so, I mean, these are the kind of interpretabilities you can do by looking at how, what kind of sensitivities are there, how the information is propagating inside the graph. Just to show you more examples, just, so in this case, the output if we are trying to go for is fork. Uh, if you just look at the detection, it's not going to work because the fork is kind of very occluded. It's not there right, right now. And so the information from broccoli and green uh, makes it uh, help you to classify the fork. It also sees a pizza somehow. Uh, there's a... Uh, there's information passing through the pizza, but that's probably the er erroneous thing which is happening here. Um, it seems that the pizza class is a lot very strong because it seems to happen in here as well. So in this case, it's basically uh, the output we are trying to go for is dining table. And remember, this is hard because the image is a montage image. It's not really the kind of images that you are likely to on which it is trained on. The information is passing through mostly bowl and also somehow pizza. Again, it seems that the pizza classifier is firing all over the place, and that's why the information is still going through it. But at least it helps you to understand how these information is traveling, what is happening, and so on. Um, now, one of the big, big restrictions in all this approach is that because I'm doing end-to-end -end learning, I'm assuming that I have labeled images for fork, labeled images for dining table, and so on. This whole zero shot has been lost. The way I actually motivated the inference, like reasoning about visual uh, reasoning was that humans can do zero shot. but uh, with this knowledge graph stuff and bringing end to end, I kind of lost the zero shot recognition uh, in this whole pipeline. So just two days ago, we submitted a paper uh, to NIPS, and 
of course, you guys, since I submitted two days ago, I don't have slides. Here is the one main figure in from the paper, which I'm going to use to explain. So basically, this right now is NEL plus NEL graphs. So finally, we have been able to move from like hand labeled graphs to NEL plus NEL graphs. So this one has like tens of thousands of nodes uh, inside this. Um, and the input to this is, so these are the green ones are NEL nodes, the gray ones are NEL nodes. So these are, this is linguistic knowledge, this is visual knowledge. The input to each of the node is the semantic embedding. This is word to vec vector. So we basically give word to vec, third 100 dimensional word to vec vector as input. We do some graph convolution network on top. And our, our goal is to generate the SVM classifier. This is the same, we are going back to the same out thing. We are going to learn how to map semantic embeddings to the classifiers and the, for these categories. So what we are hoping is that we are seeing uh, semantic embeddings for all the categories, but in the training time, we are only seeing few categories. And now we want to test on completely not unseen category that we have never seen before. For example, Okapi was not there in the uh, test set, but by having the semantic embedding of Okapi and the relationships of Okapi to the rest of the graph, you can actually figure out what kind of classifier for Okapi would be there. And this is the case where we are combining semantic embedding, like linguistic knowledge and visual knowledge together to give the outputs. And this seems to work really good uh, right now. Um, we, and we are using a six layer graph conventional network on this. Okay, so this is some of the efforts that we have been doing um, on the uh, combining knowledge graphs with end-to-end -end learning. Um, in the last part of the talk, and since I have nine minutes, I'm going to be efficient about this one. Um, so what Neil and, uh, has been focusing on in the uh, initial part was basically learning semantic knowledge. But of course, common sense knowledge is much beyond semantic knowledge. It's, we need to have functional knowledge of how do humans use different kinds of objects. Physics is also a kind of common sense knowledge. And dynamic common sense, like if a building is falling like this, it will continue to fall. These causality-based relationships is also the kind of common sense knowledge we want to focus on. So I have been taking a three-pronged approach to tackle this part, which is a bulk of common sense knowledge that we have to learn. The first part is we are trying to learn this kind of common sense knowledge from videos. And so this is in collaboration with AI2. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but since this is in collaboration, hopefully you should have heard from the vision team. Uh, of what this is, but the idea is we are collecting this large scale data set of people using uh, uh, different kind of uh, objects for different daily activities. And so this is the way, the way we have collected this data is we send the scripts to Mechanical Turk. People in India, China, um, US, I mean basically they take these videos, they upload it on YouTube with Creative Commons license, and now we have the whole script and what people are doing. We are making sure that these are boring videos, like daily activities, so that we can actually learn common sense knowledge from these videos. And so we can collect right now, for example, 1,000 videos per day just by using Mechanical Turk for this thing. And this seems like a perfect data. So what people generally use in vision for action recognition is YouTube data, which is totally the non-perfect data for any kind of learning. Because in YouTube data, you see cats flying, cats talking, and so on. And this is what we, the kind of data we want to learn. So one of the things that we have in CMU have been able to do with such kind of data is has been able to learn predictive models. Okay, so basically given a static image. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just moving forward instead of. Okay, so um, what you can learn is predictive models. Like given a static frame, you can predict what are the future frames look like. So in this case, 20% probability that the hand is going to move like this. 19% probability that the hand is going to move like this. And we are able to generate like sample, lot of samples of the future and use it for prediction. Um, another approach in the three-pronged approach is using simulations. And that is something which we have been doing with Roosevelt. Okay, and it's basically trying to use simulations for learning physics models. And again, I'm not going to spend time on it since this is again in collaboration with AI2 that we have been focusing on. The part I want to focus on is basically uh, um, using physical interactions themselves. So humans do this active physical interaction with the world. We throw blocks, we keep put blocks in our mouth. This kind of physical interaction and active exploration of the world seems very, very important for learning knowledge because it allows you the power of intervention. Something which current, if I'm learning from web, I do not have this power of intervention. I can change one variable only and see what happens in my world. That will help you to do learning much, much faster than if you're randomly sampling data from the internet. So we want to focus on can we have this power of intervention, change one variable at a time and see what happens inside this learning systems. That will hopefully make us learn much, much faster. Um, so as a first effort, what we tried was 
to build this robotic system that will go and explore the world. So we tried first for grasping. So in this setting, we have a tabletop setting. And the robot just tries to go and randomly grasp. So it's a random grasp. Like in any random location, it tries to grasp for it. Um, the wrist has a force sensor that automatically detects whether the grasp was successful or not. So when the grasp is successful, the uh, face will turn smile. Uh, the face will smile, basically. So for example, in this case, the face smiles because it was able to <laughs> lift this. Um, so we basically do this kind of self-supervised grasping for not one time, a thousand times, but 50,000 times. So we basically collect a data set of 50,000 uh, random grasps. We basically let the robot run for 16 hours a day unmanned and basically for 700 robot hours. We collect this large scale data. And once we have the large scale data, we can basically start learning grasping properties of different kinds of object and see the generalization of grasping properties. So here are the kind of uh, results that you can get. Okay, somehow my laptop has turned really slow. Um, so here are the kind of things you can do generalization. So we can get 73% grasping rates if you try to generalize to unseen objects completely. And here's an example of clutter cleaning uh, that we can do. Of course, there's a question of, a lot of people ask me, will this ever scale up? Because we collected 50,000 examples for grasp. Now, if I'm trying to learn the push, I have to collect 50,000 properties of push and so on. So in fact, a lot of people are doing that. For example, Berkeley, after our work, tried to collect 50,000 examples of pushing. But really, this seems unsatisfying, like trying to collect 50,000 examples, 100,000 examples, every time of every task. So what we were interested in was, can we somehow do multitask learning? Like, have a common model across all the tasks for different tasks and see what happens. So uh, basically, we ended up diversifying explorations. So we learned a model for push. So our robot basically pushes thousands of objects. It learns a model. We are given the initial image and the final state. It figures out what kind of force it should apply to basically get that change in the world. Uh, the third thing we have tried is tactile sensing. So our fing uh, finger has a skin sensor. And it tries to go and push objects into the table. And in the process, it basically sees what kind of tactile feedback it is getting. So for soft ties, it, get, it gets very low feedback. For hard objects, it's getting high feedback, essentially. And then we learn a joint model for all these three different tasks and try to basically uh, have this common uh, network across all the three different tasks. And the reason I'm mentioning this work especially is because we found something very, very interesting. So we found that multitask learning actually helps, but even to the power that if you have 5,000 examples of grasp, that works worse on grasping as compared to 2,500 grasp examples and 2,500 push examples. So it seems that the push data is much more important for grasping than actually the grasping data itself. And this is something which is completely unheard of in any data-driven approaches. Like if you're going for a task X, you should collect data for task S. That's the, that is the most important part. But it turns out in this robotic tasks, it is more important to go for exploration and diversification of data rather than trying to collect the same data for each task. Uh, of course, in the lower regime, when you have only a few hundred examples, grasp data is most important. You, for grasping tasks, you should just keep collecting grasping tasks task and so on. Um, OK. We have also tried using all this data of, since I have like last two minutes, um, we have tried using all this data for learning visual representations and stuff. And it seems to work really good compared to even better than ImageNet performances for some of the image tasks. Um, however, one of the big problems, and I'm going to jump my slide to last slide, uh, that we have been seeing is that most of the biggest problem with robots is that these robots are in the lab. So if I actually want to use the robots to improve, let's say, Pascal classification, it's never going to happen because Pascal has cats and dogs, and there are no cats and dogs on my robot tabletop setting. I, uh, so there's something definitely we need to tackle to bring these robots to the real world or take these kind of ex active exploration into the real world. So to explore that, we built a drone with this re uh, real world poking. So the idea is that the drone hull has um, the skin sensor around it. And this, this is how the data is collected. You can see that the drone is hitting randomly hundreds and thousands of objects. So it basically goes and hits as many objects. It has the skin sensor around it, so it basically gets the haptic feedback of what, what is happening when it hits different objects. Uh, and we are using all this data of uh, uh, haptic to basically try to uh, learn a navigation model of drone. This is one of the applications we are looking at. But of course, the main purpose is to collect haptic data for uh, feedback for uh, all the possible views. 
So I just want to show some, what are the kind of things you can do if you have this like scale up the learning, self supervised learning with drones. So this is the drone view right now. You are seeing the drone trying to fly, uh, uh, just trying to avoid obstacles. And this has been collected all by the crashing data. So the crashing data is telling you how the drone should not fly. It's a negative data essentially. So this is, it, using all that negative data, it learns how to fly and avoid all the obstacles essentially. So you can see it goes towards the person, but then it realizes that this is an obstacle. So it turns back and it then ends up going towards this big corridor where it can it fly without um, hitting many objects. <laughs> um, there's no Kalman tracker, so you can see how it changes dr dramatically. I think the interesting one is the third person view of the drone, so I'm waiting for that. So this seems, tells you a much better picture of how the drone is flying inside the scene. So you can see in this big corridor, the drone is flying. It basically goes towards the wall and then it tries to turn then it will go to another like glass wall. It has, because, because it has had glass walls in the past, it knows that's an obstacle. So it basically turns around and goes. You can do it, because we have collected all this data in real world, you can have like real world clutters and try to basically avoid real world clutters. So in this case, you are seeing that the, the drone is trying to avoid chairs. When we collected the data, humans are there in the scene as well. So we are, so basically the drone is being collected in the second floor of our Smith building where there are humans sitting and the drone is basically hitting all the possible objects. So it has hit some humans as well during the testing. So it knows how to avoid humans as well. So like here is a person walking and the drone tries to avoid him while he's walking. Okay, so I think with that, I'm going to conclude. So the, um, I've basically focused on the three parts. The first is composition and contextuality. Oh shit. Um, the second basically, I've tried to focus on how we can use knowledge graph learning, knowledge graphs with end-to-end -end learning. And finally, we are trying to expand our knowledge, visual knowledge to physics, functionalities, and so on. And so for that, we are using real physical exploration with the world. That's it. Thank you.